right, so when we begin our test, we're going to take our specimens and we're going to place them in the locking jaws. You, tr you want to try to get these as close to the center as possible. I'm going to bring the cross head down just a little bit here just to get my sample a little bit closer. So you want to place your sample as best as you can inside in the middle. This might take a little a few tries but might have to come down a little bit more. Uh, we might be okay there so I'm gonna place the samples or the sample inside the jaws and the clamps. I'm just gonna apply a little bit of pressure just so the teeth inside, I, I didn't show you, but there's teeth inside the clamp that grip the, the sample. So you want a good purchase on it. So I'm just kind of giving it a little bit of a bite on the sample. You want to make sure that the faces are flush. If they're rotated, you'll add some torsion to it, some torque, which will affect the results. So once we have our sample in place, it's secured. We're going to place our extensometer and this will measure the minute changes that are going to occur that we can't see visually. So the change in the length that's going to happen using our extensometer, this gauge will be applied to a location where we think it will fail. We'll apply the springs. We apply the springs. We'll go ahead and remove the pin. Once we remove the pin, we want to be sure that the extensometer doesn't move because it's calibrated to an initial set length or distance to begin its calculations. Once we have that information, we have our monitor, we're going to change our area. The area was the cross-sectional area that you should have calculated based off of the diameter. And mine for 1018 steel is going to be 0 0.0967. We will leave the next three values unchanged will change the very last one which will be the diameter of the sample the diameter of the sample was the one that you obtained 0 0.351 i'm going to zero my load zero signal i'm going to zero the cross-sectional head i'm going to zero the extensometer i'll leave the time that has no relevance at this point uh, my diameter have an error. I put two decimals accidentally. So that should clear that up. Once we have zeroed everything, we can go ahead and run the test. As we run the test, it's just going to ask me one more time to verify the diameter. It is 0.351. I hit OK. And the test will begin. Uh, we're in that linear portion and linear trend of elast elastic region. We've passed the elastic region. We're obtaining our altered tensile strength. We see the necking happening or occurring here at the bottom, and then failure. The software is going to ask return to zero. Do not return to zero until you remove your specimen, you remove your extensometer. I'm just going to place the pin back in so I don't damage the extensometer. We need to remove the sample because when we return to zero we want to be sure that we're not crashing into itself so we have our samples we can look at our values we can return to zero here we can look at the data that is obtained once completing the test let me make this a little bit larger So there's a few things that we have on here and we're referring back to the, some of those key terms that we had on the stress strain curve that you need to obtain. You're given this slope one, slope two, you're given two points. You should be able to calculate your modulus. That modulus that you calculate should correspond to the exact same modulus that is produced here as a value. And this is in MSI, mega pounds per square inch. So the values you get, you should be able to calculate. It should give you the same value. The next value we're going to look at is our offset yield index. 
if we hover over each of these points or locations, we can obtain our y value, 84,294.4 pounds per square inch. So we can obtain the value here by hovering over that specific point, and it should match our uh, stress at yield. We actually don't have it. It says uh, number invalid. Maybe we need to make it a little bit larger. No, it doesn't give us a distance. So since it doesn't give us a value specifically here for the stress at yield, we will attain that value by looking at our Y value on the curve itself. So stress at yield, we attain it from that individual point. We can go to our maximum or our ultimate tensile strength for stress, which is our Y value as well, 109,000. That should equate to our peak stress that is given to us on our value. They do match, we can go ahead and take that. One thing to consider is we're given our break index, which is our strain at failure. Um, I don't, this isn't the strain, the true strain at failure. It failed here at this point, it didn't capture it. I would go ahead and select this pointed value on our strain. Remember our strain is on our x-axis. So using our x-axis value, we're at 0.561306 inch over inch. This will be our strain at failure. Every point beyond our strain net failure, this return to linear line, is our extensometer reverting back to a position after failure. So every value after this point can be negated. What we're wanting to see is our from our linear trend and our elastic region, we start seeing some curvature to our plastic region, our ultimate tensile strength to our strain net failure. Each of the values can be obtained either by their point locations and x, y coordinates or some of these values that are provided on the right hand tab. Okay, we have completed both our, our tests on the samples and one thing that we do have to consider is our fracture appearance and what happens during this process. And what we have occurring, it's a little bit harder to see on this one, but our ten, we can see the difference between our 1018 steel and our 4140 steel on each of their fracture appearances. What we have on our 1018 steel is what we call a cup and ball. And that is more uh, prevalent to uh, ductile material. And we can see a formation of that cupping happening on the edge or the uh, circumference of where the material failed or occurred at compared to our 4140. Our 4140 has more of jagged peaks, hills and valleys, um, as I would call it, being more characteristic of brittleness. And the difference between the two, they're both steel. Um, both are comprised of iron and carbon mostly but the determining factor on their appearance or their fracture on whether being ductile, which is a little bit more elastic in nature than brittle, um, is the carbon content. Our carbon content is 0.18% by weight for 1018, and for 4140 it's 0.40% by weight. So the consequent of adding carbon to uh, the steel or the volume of carbon is that we get a higher ultimate tensile strength for 4140 than we do for 1018, but as a result, the material becomes more brittle as opposed to a more milder steel like 1018. Uh, once we have our samples and we've looked at our fracture appearance and determined what type uh, that we are observing, what we need to do is try to place our samples or specimens back to their original um, state here before, let me use the table. So we're going to try to line these up as best as we can. We line them up as best as we can and the reason, as I mentioned earlier, is making these initial marks is so after our testing is complete we can come back 
and measure our gauge length because we're going to need this second measurement to calculate the reduction of area or percent reduction of area or ROA. So now we should be able to obtain our second value for the specific calculation on the equation. You do that for all your samples. Once you have that information, the second portion or another portion that you're going to have to consider is we need to export the data now. When we export the data, what we're wanting to do is replicate the stress strain curves that were obtained through the test itself. What we're going to do is select a separate setting. And I'm going to hit uh, export here. So data was exported. We'll open the test. And when I open the test, this is what's going to display or show. It doesn't give us the stress strain curve entirely. It gives us a set of data points throughout that entire curve. So once we've ran our test, uh, we have obtained all our results, all the values that we do need. The last portion of what we need to do on the testing is export our data into Excel. And when we export our data into Excel, we're going to obtain initially our four columns that are produced, so everything to the left-hand side here. We have our crosshead in inches, load in pounds force, time in seconds, our extensometer in inches. The two columns that we're going to need to consider are our load in pounds force and our extensometer. Uh, our extensometer gives our change in length already. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to take our force to calculate our stress to replicate our stress strain curve. We have stress on the y-axis, strain on the x. To obtain, obtain stress, we have our force divided by our cross-sectional area for every single data point. That gives us our point location for our y-axis. We can then take our extensometer. I just went ahead and did my calculation here on this specific column for my stress. Stress is force over the area. Area is going to be consistent, doesn't change. My strain, I'm just copying over my results as it already gives us our change in length. Uh, so we have our change in length we, for our, our x-axis, which is our strain. We have our stress, which is our force, or I'm sorry, um, our stress. We can plot our stress strain curve. Remember on our diagram, or what we had seen prior on our test was our strain at failure, it reverted back to a final position. We need to delete this line. It's not part of the curve. So on our graph, you need to be aware of what our last position or our last point is and delete any points or point that is after that position so we don't have that line obscure our stress strain curve. Sure.